The next interview is with Gary Wimmer. In 1977, he had an extraordinary near-death, out-of-body experience, and some of that that he experienced is actually happening now. He got a little bit of a preview. The deal with the interview was, I hit record, and there's nothing there. And it shut my computer down when I tried to play it. So this is kind of a precursor to that interview and a little bit more about my own paranormal experiences. Touching on the Ingo Swan art imagery, an E.T. encounter that taught me a thing or two about fear and hearing the fairies. So take two with Gary, trying to do everything I can to troubleshoot it and make sure that when it says it's recording, it actually is. Never a dull moment. Recording, there's a button I push and the volume is there. And then I see the red light, which lets me know I'm recording. And I watch as the timer goes forward. What happened with Gary is a surprise or was a surprise. And my husband even came in the room and saw that the unit was recording. However, when I went to play it back, nothing had been recorded. It showed that I had pushed the button and it showed that there had been some engagement. But when I actually tried to, re, to review it, it shut the machine down. So I had to go in and physically remove it from the record file to be able to access that record file again. These are the things that, okay, somewhere, some way, someone will explain that there is an appropriate operator error term that must have happened. But when I am interviewing people who have psychic abilities, medium abilities, intuitive abilities that are really extraordinary, which Gary does have, then there are other factors that play in. And especially when I have anomalies like audio recordings with EVPs, then there's another element. And my night lights have always been a factor. That's always been, for 25 years, that interactive blink has been a presence. And sometimes it happens with other, with uh, regular lights, like the, the room light or a, a lamp light, any kind of electrical and battery-operated <laughs> light. Okay, so yeah, it's just, I get so... Uh, frustrated with trying to explain it over and over and over again. I can't explain it. I don't know why. I just know it happens, and I know there's a telepathic connection with it. Sometimes I'll get a prompt or some kind of an instruction or some kind of communication that tells me that something's happening. Other times I won't. And so my understanding of that is the times that I don't, it's a presence that is choosing not to or cannot communicate with me, either because I'm too dense I'm not aware, I'm not schooled, I'm not in sync with that element. And I don't have a problem with that. But I do know that with a lot of this stuff, we try to put labels on it. And our labels, I think at this point, we don't know the entire range, the spectrum available to us with these other entities, these other beings, this, this other consciousness that is connecting with us. And so sometimes it might be that... As, as has happened before, the neighbor across the street died and is trying to get a message, and you are the conduit. You are the I am, the medium, the intermediary. And unless I know something like that has happened, and my bracelet hit the table, that's what that little ding sound is. Unless I know that, then I may or may not figure that out. And when the neighbor across the street died, and I went over to see the daughter. There were some little mugs, the happy face mugs, which I like. And I was asking if she was going to have a yard sale or because they were, they were going through the house and getting rid of it. The mom was still there, and she was going into a, an assisted living facility. I'd seen them before. It was an, it was the, the gentleman walked the streets with his dog. He had a collie, and he wore uh, an oxygen tank and was just very, very much alive and present in our neighborhood. I, he, he was almost like a guardian, you know, the, the, the constant presence. And so it was, it, was, it was really a big, empty feeling when he, when he died. Later on, and she said, no, they, they, were, they were just going to pack things up and, and get rid of everything. So I wished her well and, you know, um, said, 
that that was great and left. But what happened later, I was working on my something writing my com- on my computer and the door doorbell rang right before that <laughs> I don't know why the light went out and the one of the bulbs I had like an oct- octagon light and um the one of the bulbs went dark the yellow one went went dark and this has happened before so I know okay well all right so I took a picture and then doorbell rings and she's there, and she's got these two mugs, these two happy face mugs, and she said, and she gave them to me. I offered to give her something. No, 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 these are for you. And what I believe, my way of interpreting this, because this is how I work, it was a gift from him to me, and she happened to pick up on that, and there it was. There's also on this light stand with the, the light that, that burned out, which I sometimes I remember and sometimes I forget. That's the wonderful thing about memory. <laughs> it isn't consistent. Um, and no matter what, I wish it were, but it isn't. And so sometimes I remembered that the light bulb burned out at the same time, and sometimes I just remember the orb on the light stand, and I have a picture. It's so nice. I don't know what possessed me to, to take the picture at that time, but somehow I had the presence of mind to document that. And there are times, so many times, when these things happen, I don't have documentation. I don't have any kind of uh, corroborative evidence. I just have my own awareness, my own memory, as it is, of how things transpired. And whatever it is that happens in those moments gives me proof, evidence, whatever I need to know that my reality is working for me. The thing about reality is each of us has a unique interaction. We are not alike. And so whatever works for me may or may not work for anyone else. So if I have to prove it and someone else has absolutely no idea, no awareness, no inclination to buy into my reality, it will not work for them. I've watched this. When I, perf- I, I took a, um, an opportunity to make a presentation and then show someone else who was a scientist and then somebody else who was a psychotherapist uh, took it to their, that house to show the interaction with my nightlight. The one thing I do know that I didn't ask permission with the enter. The, with the energies there. I just showed up to do this, and I had already taken it to a public uh, venue, and it had worked just fine there. To this house, there are two people who are skeptics, and it shut it down. It didn't work. And I've even taken it to places where there were lots and lots and lots of people, you know, as, as a public p- performance, public presentation. This is what it does. And like clockwork, it worked. But for these two individuals who were scientists, researchers, skeptics, it didn't work. And it hurt my feelings <laughs> at first. i like, oh my gosh. And then there was the other thing of, well, what will they think of me? And I thought later when I realized it, it isn't, and it's always said, I'm not a dog and pony show. This is not a, this is not a joke. And I don't perform on command. And those kinds of things saying, indicating that this is my deal. And it isn't meant to take to show somebody else who may or may not believe in it that it does a trick. Here's a backflip. No, doesn't do that. And not only that, the fact that with within their own limits, they have restricted these kinds of interactions and made them almost impossible because of their beliefs. And the rigidity to say, prove it to me. Make me see it. Make me believe. Now, when you listen to that and you hear that kind of energy, (laughs) there's a barrier, a big wall between that individual and anything else outside. And so not only did my light not perform, they didn't have at that point, between their own, you know, the communication between the two was that I had made these things up, and this is fiction. 
from that moment on, my relationship with the other person who was the researcher was diminished. And and it was a good thing. Um, this was also an indication for me, wrong place, wrong people, wrong time. The reason that it happened was to help me understand the limitations that come to psychic abilities and psychic phenomena when we have people who are dead set against allowing it to exist. It frightens them. It doesn't, it doesn't work in their reality. It isn't, um, it isn't autopilot. It isn't on command. It isn't controllable. And that's the cool thing about it. It isn't. Because if it were, there are people with these abilities and this kind of information or who want to access information who have, if any, few scruples and few limits, few ethics. And that is also part of this. There, there are reasons that certain people are allowed to go to great heights and, and have extraordinary abilities when they use them to do no harm and to be helpful or to, in some way, shift a paradigm, a reality. And the entities who work with us determine that. They see us long before we even have any awareness that they exist. And that's the other thing about this, that when you have these abilities, no matter where you go, there are other entities there who have already seen you coming. And they determine what will happen and how it will be presented, if at all, by your actions and your intentions. And that's what, you know, when you talk about somebody's aura or somebody's lights, uh, when I've had entities show up, I ask them, well, how did you know I was here? Well, we saw your lights. Well, what, what lights did you see? And they told me they saw red and green. And I've seen the orbs that I work with, the entities, the, the thought forms, and they showed me orange, a beautiful orange glow, looks like a, a cloud type thing. It's, it's um, a, almost, you can see through it, but it's opaque, okay? Uh, so, so in other words, a cloud or a fog. And however, it is, it's, it's round, so it isn't, it isn't just wispy. Um, there, there's, for us, um, there's, there's not always going to be an element that's visual. They, and that's what I have understood is that this isn't always something that our eyes can register. So when we do register something like that, it's helpful. And whatever has made that possible is trying to prove a point or, give some kind of reassurance that, yes, you're not just making all of this stuff up. We're here. Here you go. Now, the night lights have done that, too. The problem with the visual is you get dependent on it. It's, it's something that is a, a, a perk and a reward, and when it isn't there, it's like, is it still happening? And it was happening before it was there. So, so as I've worked with my night lights, and they've gradually, uh, there isn't the same kind of absolute manic action that there was at the very beginning. For one thing, I burned out a few bulbs. <laughs> and so the one that I work with the most now is, is uh, on a limited lifespan. Okay. So I know that it's trying not to burn out the bulb, which it told me five years ago, it was going to start doing that. So it would conserve the light. And so at night when a night light is supposed to be on, no, this one isn't on. <laughs> it, and now it isn't on. Uh, it, it waits between, maybe sometimes it'll be weeks or months, and then it will flicker, and I'll worry, okay, is it, is it burned out? Are you, are you there? And there might be a little blink. Okay, yeah, you're there. And there might not. And then a few days later, it'll be on for 24 hours. Blink, blink, blink. Or on and off for 24 hours. But there will be interactivity. And so the, f the fun thing about that is I did put it on YouTube. The very first one that I liked, which is probably now about maybe 15 years old, um, I didn't like me. I didn't like how I looked, so I took it off. And then I decided the second one was even worse. <laughs> but I better, had, I better at least pose something because um, I was going to run out of opportunities. <laughs> so, so And I haven't taken that one down. Uh, so, you know, the, the fun thing is the, the ego that goes with this of, oh, I could have done that better. And, you know, you do it so many times and, and it never lives up to the way you want it to. 
but the nightlight performs. Okay, so there you go. That's that, and that was what it was about. Uh, and so the the problem I have is in in my own reality, this is normal. But trying to open it up to someone else and say this exists, and these kinds of energies, entities, beings are around us in many different forms. When I heard the fairy singing in the yard, and that's what I call them, um, I was just doing some weeding in the yard, and the clouds were above. It looked like it might rain. We were all along the line, which is, you know, when you see on one side it's raining, the other side it's clear. There was, there was a line going across, and it was above the yard. And so there was rain to the north and to the south. It was sunny. And I heard these little voices and it took me a minute, just, you know, just a second or two to figure out, oh my gosh, this is, this is beside me. It's in the yard and they sound like they're on helium and mother bring the rain that we might drink. And so it was a little sing song chant, mother bring the rain that we might drink. And I didn't see anything, but I felt the presence and it was multiple and they were singing and chanting to bring the rain. And at that point, the clouds moved just enough for us to have some sprinkles in the yard. And that was it. And that's all they wanted. That was it. That, that was just, but it was, it was so incredible to be part of that interaction. And the, the, the thing is that I've had a lot of those kinds of interactions, but to share them and to talk about them and to say this is real is difficult because there are so many barriers when in a society and many societies who refuse to acknowledge that these realities exist and that we can engage them and encounter them. Uh, so so that, that part of it, I think, is along with being my nightlight experience, my paranormal, metaphysical, supernatural experience. And the ETs that I've experienced are pleasant, helpful, and wanting to encourage us the biggest thing is that we are supposed to, we should, we need to, if we want to go any further, use our telepathic abilities and develop them and practice. And you can practice with animals. They'll let you know if you have hit the target or not. And that's one of the reasons that animals are, are part of our existence. They are teachers. And so many times we, we miss that. We, we miss that. We, we have this idea that we are superior because of our intellect and we can do math <laughs> and all sorts of other fun things. We can spell. Boy, oh boy. Um, okay. Nature doesn't have to do any of that. It just exists perfectly. And if you want to communicate with an animal, you have to learn their language. The language of body movement, of eye movement, of physical contact, of scent, of sound. And those are how we improve our own abilities and our awareness of what's helpful and hurtful in our environment and what's healthful, not just for us, but for animals and nature and the ecosystem, the planet. Those are extraordinary opportunities that we all have. And it happens when you start having the experience of knowing that others are in your presence, that People may die, they don't have a body, but the awareness and the personality can still come through and make a connection. Those are extraordinary opportunities that we all have, and it happens when you start having the experience of knowing that others are in your, are in your presence that people may die, they don't have a body, but the awareness and the personality can still come through and make a connection. I've had that with deceased relatives and with deceased people that I don't know, but I know their relatives. <laughs> and um, that, that isn't always a positive thing, depending on how the person died. Uh, there can be some, some trauma, drama, sorrow, and discomfort because of that. Now, fortunately, I don't get into all of that. 
I've had it occasionally, but um, that's one of the things that you can limit. You can, or at least I've been able to um, say, no, I don't want to do this. This isn't, this isn't for me. And keep it light. Um, if it's necessary, then I'll get information that might be a little darker, depending on what, who's, who's talking. But the fun stuff is when the entity shows up with its person and the action is visible. I had a woman who wanted to show me her interaction with a son who had died. And she said, I don't know, I don't know how this works. I don't understand it, but this is my medallion on my necklace. And it just, it just falls off. And this is a silver or type medallion, a metal with a, a, a finished loop that goes around a necklace. It cannot come off. There's no, there's no opening that would allow that. It's, it's complete. And as she was telling me how this happens, and she thinks it's amazing because it's her son, and it is, then the, the medallion fell off the necklace. And there were, there were three or four of us at this table as she's explaining how she experiences this and knows that her son is making a connection. And it was just so fun to be part of that. And then my problem is sometimes when the people show me pictures, they don't show me what they look like when they, when they checked out. They'll show me like when they're 16. They're, 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 they'll, they'll pick another age or something, an image to show me. And so that can be confusing sometimes when this is the picture they want to present. And there, there's a reason. Usually there'll be a reason because it, it relates to the person who, who's, who's getting the information. But it can be a little bit for me to, you know, go from point A to point B of this is why this is important and this is who this is. And it, it is relatable. So, so some of that I've had to, had to adjust and learn and it's, you know, it never stops. You're, at least for me, it's a constant. There's always something new, something different, something unique about the presence, the presentation. And I may take a minute or two to get up to speed. But the fun thing is that there is always something new. There is always more to learn. And there are so many elements to this as long as I'm alive, I will never stop learning. There's just that much. When I spoke with Ellie about Ingo Swan, her uncle, I've had information from Ingo before and giving me a picture of himself before I saw the picture that was in the book of him with a cigar. I saw him in a chair with a cigar. And that was the image I was given. And then being able to connect the dots and say, oh, yeah, this is one of his favorite photos. That was, a, that was neat. You know, it was, it was fun. And, but then there was also something about it that he wanted it, wanted it known that art was very important and very important to him. Now, the thing about Ingo and his art is that he maintained that it was important to see the art in person because when you see that kind of art, visionary art, it changes you. And I can testify to that. His work is extraordinary. And the work that she has featured in the book so that you can at least see it, it, it still has an impact. When I went, this is when I was guided, told to go to a specific location. And I took my mom. And I knew I was supposed to go to this church in Taos. I had no idea why, what the church represented. I just knew that there was an important church my guides told me I needed to go to. So we stayed at the, I think it was the Sage Inn. I think that's the name of it. It's haunted. It's been redone since then, but um, I've stayed there two or three times and had the ghost experience. The dog had had an up close and personal ghost experience. That wasn't fun. But, and the other one was the arm over, I thought it was my husband. No, no, no. It was, it was the ghost. It had a, a hairy arm over, over me. And I didn't put the, I didn't make, um, I didn't make that connection because I didn't think about how hairy the arm was. I just thought, oh, he put his arm over me. And, and then I realized later, wait a second, that arm didn't match my husband's arm. Uh, okay. So little things like that, that just keep you on your toes. So so anyway, the, the town is alive and with lots of, lots of energy. And I, we drove, I knew there was, uh, there was a sign that said the church. And so I drove, 
without knowing. I just drove to the church. It was raining and cloudy. And so we drove to the back of where this church is supposed to be. And this is a big adobe structure. I'm thinking, well, I don't see the church, but we'll find it tomorrow. This is this is where the sign says to go. And and I've seen this, you know, this beautiful adobe structure here, so it's here somewhere. So we <laughs> so we, we go to the, the hotel and stay there. And the next morning I'm told to go at a certain time. And I'm supposed to go there at, at uh, I think it was 10 o'clock. So we do breakfast and wait and then go there. And when we show up, the church doors are closed and there's a funeral. And I'm concerned because uh, this I don't know this person and it, is this rude? Well, it's also a church that uh, is very well known. Now that I know, it's very well known. And so it is a church that lots of people visit. And weddings and funerals and everything happens no matter who's visiting. But I felt like I had permission to be there. So I went up to the church and I took pictures, took picture of the, the doors, beautiful doors. And it's the, the other side of the adobe that we had seen the day before in the rain is the church front, the Church of St. Francis. And this church is well known, painted by lots of people. George O'Keefe, it's it's uh, quite <laughs> quite the church. Well, after the funeral, the church at that time of year is always refreshed, renewed, restored. They redo the adobe, the out, outside, and they also go through the inside. And so the doors from that point on were propped open. And the other thing about this is there is a piece of art that's in a nearby building that had been donated because the artist, when he painted this beautiful uh, painting of Jesus standing on the bank, the paint, when he shut the light off in the studio, glowed. And at the time he painted this, supposedly there was no way to create phosphorescent, luminescent, glow-in-the-dark paint. It scared him, and he gave it away to a good home. But the thing is, what you see is the cross. He's, Jesus has the cross, and there's a boat in the back, but those things aren't all illuminated. The whole picture isn't illuminated until they turn the light out. And they ask that there are no photographs and there is no light in that room to maintain the, the, the pictures covered. They don't want it to lose the glow. <laughs> I know how that works. Okay, so when I go there, I have a 3D uh, holographic experience. Jesus comes out from the painting, and instead of the cross on his back behind him as a burden, the cross is in front of him in the boat on the water. And he says the the message has been convoluted. The message is the cross is before you, in front of you. I'm bringing you the message, the messenger. And so it's, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And that's the, the message of love, of beauty. Everything has been convoluted to a message of trauma, a message of pain, of hurt, and a burden, the cross. And that, that isn't the message that he had, had wished, had desired for us. And so here's this holographic image of Jesus coming out from the painting in the room and transcendent. So there's, I've seen the painting, I think it's been three times now, two or three. Each time, it's a different experience. But each time, that painting speaks to me. That's visionary art, and it changes you. And that, I think, is so important to be able to experience in your lifetime something like that because it lets you know our reality is so much more dynamic than we are led to believe when we are only surface dwellers, <laughs> when we only see the, the concrete stuff around us. When you have intuition, when you have a, a psychic ability or you have some kind of a hunch, your gut is talking to you, the more you allow that to have a presence in your life, 
the more it expands so that you can see other things as well and other things can connect. Positive. It's not all negative. And that's the fear factor. Oh, what if, what if it's bad? What if, it's, what if it's, it doesn't like me or if it tries to hurt me? That's a way of dealing with reality that limits the good stuff. That, that says, okay, if you're afraid of everything, which is what the guides told me, we have to get over our fear. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it, that was the ET that showed up and um, scared me. <laughs> the voice was a mechanical voice. And the ET said my name. And I had been warned, you're going to have this experience. And I'm like, okay, yeah, right. And then at 2 a.m. or so, some, you know, in the middle of the night, dark, um, I hear from the, the, the corner of the room, which is maybe about six feet from the bed, seven feet, eight feet, somewhere in there. Um, if, if it's not, it's in the room, it's not outside. And, uh, it says my name, Winnie. And, um, it's, it, I can't, I can't duplicate how it was said, but the way that it said it and the sound was so foreign, the vibration, the frequency I was absolutely mortified, and I felt my I felt myself freeze from head to toe. I felt this go through me. This this, and I thought, oh my gosh, because I thought I had a handle on my fear, and and um and they they laughed and said, that's what we told you. You have to get rid of your fear. Well, if fear is innate, it's a part of us. It's a survival thing. We are programmed to be afraid of things that are so out, so far outside our paradigm, that that they immediately tell us run. Well, I couldn't run. I was in bed. <laughs> so I just got the impact of, oh, and I knew the minute that, that I had that, that twinge, that, you know, that, that lightning bolt of, holy cow, what is this? I knew, okay, that's what they're talking about. And I'm, I'm trying to shut it down because I thought the minute I had that energetic shift, I shut down any way to communicate because I basically put the wall up and said, go away, you know. Um, and do not enter, go away. And I thought, okay, that's, but that's what we do as a way of of protecting ourselves, self-preservation. And so the thing is to understand that that's autopilot. It's a given and it's okay to understand that will be present and work through it and allow it and say, what can I learn from this? Okay. And you can do however it works for you. This is, I'm telling you how it works for me and how I have been able to manage it. Uh, the other thing too, that you, you do want to maintain is humility because it's like when I took my little nightlight to show the researcher and the psychotherapist who immediately thought I was a loon, um, (laughs) which is, ah, that's how that goes. Uh, the, the humility is that it's okay. It, not everyone is going to get what you do and who you are and the things that you encounter. It doesn't make them go away. It makes it your experience. And as long as you continue working your energy, your way, your interaction, then you have something worth knowing, worth teaching, worth sharing. And it will go where it needs to go. It doesn't have to go to the masses. It can go to one person, and that one one person is forever changed. It's like seeing that picture. I don't. I know not everyone who shows up to see the picture there in Taos at the church has the same experience. Jesus go, doesn't come out and turn the cross around and say, "Hey, they've got the cross in the wrong direction. It's supposed to be in front of me, not behind me, because I am the messenger and I'm carrying the word out." All right, so. But that was a really, really amazing experience. And I wasn't a whole, I wasn't into Jesus. <laughs> I wasn't there for Jesus. I was there because the guides told me to go to the church. All right. And then the, the kicker. They asked me later when I come home and I'm, you know, processing what happened and how it was and how, how, how really cool everything it was. What did you do when you went to the church? Well, I took a picture. And how did you take the picture? Because I wanted to take a picture of the doors. Well, I, the only way I could get that full picture in view was to get on my knees. <laughs> and then there was the chuckle. So you went to the knees, or you went to the church, got on your knees. Uh-huh, yeah, got on my knees at the church to pray. Isn't that funny? Okay, 
sometimes we just have to trust that right place, right time, there is learning and, and things will turn out for the best in a way that we need them. And it doesn't matter who's witnessing, who's with us, who's judging, who's awarding and rewarding, you know, those things are irrelevant. It's nice when you get compliments and you, it's nice when you get validation, but it doesn't end there. The way that you learn is to continue with or without validation, with or without judgment, because this trip is about you. I hope that you can learn something and share something along the way that's as extraordinary as some of these other things that other people are sharing. Because that's what makes life fun. And that's what makes all of this ex- very, very, I think, amazing and fun for just being here without having anybody else tell you how to do it right or wrong. You just learn as you go and you grow. And the people and the encounters you have as a result are beyond measure worth living and maybe more than once (laughs) know it and not all right thanks for listening i appreciate you for showing up and giving me your time and i hope you have something you can carry forward from this and from all of your explorations thank you